Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Janice Oliva, President of ISC Magazine. A big welcome to you to today's ISC webinar entitled Fiber Optic Tech Tap Couplers for FTTX Systems, presented in partnership with Light Brigade. Before we get started, if you would please remember, if you've requested to receive a BICC CEC, you will receive one credit for attending this live webinar. Please note that the Big C CECs are not available for the recorded webinars, just for the live ones. So a little bit of information about the webinar today. The use of fiber optic tap splitters allows tremendous flexibility when designing rule and low density FTTX systems. These splitters are often used in monitoring optical power levels. They provide a cost-effective solution when using traditional fiber and cable management products. And today, you're going to learn how to maximize OLT card efficiency in rural FTX, FTTX installations, what are TAP couplers and how do they work, and how to utilize TAP splitters to monitor live P2P and P2MP fiber solutions how to incorporate TAP splitters into existing installations as well. But before we get started, if I can again remind everyone, if you don't already receive ISE Magazine in print or digital format, please do sign up for your complimentary copy of ISE Magazine, the how-to resource for ICT providers across the globe. The link is on your screen as well as the information tabs of this webinar. And please do put on your calendar a little note about ISE Expo 2018. This year, or next year, I should say, it's going to be held in Denver, Colorado on August 14th through the 17th. And we hope to see you there in person. So now on to some details about our sponsor and presenter. Today's webinar would not be made possible without our sponsor, Light Brigade. Since 1987, Light Brigade has instructed more than 50,000 attendees in its public and custom classrooms. The company offers nationwide courses that cover basic fiber optic design, maintenance and testing, as well as more advanced topics such as FTTX, fiber characterization, and video for traffic or surveillance. The company offers course development services and will customize, create a course to any fiber optic subject matter or skill level. In addition, Light Brigade produces professional quality educational DVDs and online training. All of Light Brigade's training materials are technology-based and demonstrate theory and techniques applicable to any manufacturer's product. Now, let me introduce you to our esteemed presenter, Mr. Larry Johnson. Larry has been at the forefront of the fiber optics industry since 1977. He has built a solid reputation in all aspects of fiber optic design, installation, implementation, testing, and measurement. He participated in the early development of fiber optic standards used for installation, testing, and measurement of network and physical plant and continues to monitor standard activities. His leadership in the optical fiber industry has been outstanding and well-renowned. And in addition, he has written a book on testing and troubleshooting fiber optic systems, also written 20 courses on fiber optics and developed 10 industry certification programs for a variety of industries. You can reach him directly after this uh, webinar if you'd like to via his email, which is Larry, L-A-R-R-Y, at likebrigade.com. So finally, before we move on to the topic of the day, just a few logistics about the webinar so you can utilize this platform. The information tabs at the top of your screen allow you to find out more information about our speaker and our sponsor. The event resources tab on the left side will allow you to download a copy of the slides from today's presentation at any time during this uh, webinar. You can do that and download the slides. Finally, you can submit questions throughout the presentation, again, at any time, using the Ask a Question tab. 
please do submit those as they come to you, and then I will hold them until our Q&A session at the end of the presentation, which at that time we'll answer as many possible, as many questions as we possibly can. If we don't have time, however, we will make sure that your contact information is sent out to uh, Mr. Johnson and he can reach you offline. And with that, I'd like to hand the webinar over to our presenter, Mr. Larry Johnson. Take it away, Larry. Hi. Hi there. Thanks, Janice, for the introduction and that. So um, I'm really excited about this talk because it's something different, but it's also something that we've, we've used optical components in fiber optics for a long time, and that's where I wanted to talk about what a lot of people would think as a, as a standard product today, but yet there's so many variations of it. So let me go through the introduction slides here. Janice did a great cover, so I don't think I need to, to redo or read this to you, so if you want to see the bullets. Uh, but it's been a lot of fun. And the last bullet, FTTX training since 2000, just as a point, my first fiber to the home um, conference was in 1989, and, and so following it's been really fun to watch it as it's developed to, from conceptual to actual practical applications. But the use of tap couplers is, uh, does, is not limited only to FTTX. I want you to keep that in mind as we, as we progress. And that, so we do have challenges in that, and um, the rural side in, in particular. So, you know, one of the questions we have to ask is where should network elements be placed into the field? So what is a network element? Well, from, a, from the tiers of the fiber optic industry, and there's four tiers, there's a component level that sells to the subassembly level, that sells to the system level, that sells to the end users, and all this. So in some cases, we can talk about a network element, such as a tapered splitter, it's just a component that you're going to put in a splice tray, and um, very easy to accommodate. On other cases, they may be packaged as a subassembly, assembly, which can be put into a splice closure, could be put into a pedestal or a fiber distribution hub. And, that, and, and again, those as the, the systems are built up, they get more complex than that. For, for, for example, a fiber distribution hub is more complex than just the splitter itself. But some of the trends that we do see in rural areas is, one, low density. And that's a challenge for systems that are really designed to maximize the take rates on OLT cards. Um, so we have to look at things a little different. The other one is because the density is lower, some of the distances get longer too in that, and especially in between uh, subscribers. So, um, that, so that's one case. The other one is uh, the drop cables aren't where a house is necessarily 75 feet from a street. They could literally be hundreds of feet from, this, uh, from the roadway. And, and the other one is we want to leverage as much of the existing infrastructure as possible and that um, from this. And that, so if you have a legacy single-mode fiber installed, we want to use it in that versus placing new fiber and cable. And uh, so I'm going to talk about these different elements, but also just looking at the graphics. So imagine a two-lane road in a rural area, and so we have a farm over one way, then we have a house across the street, and later down there's a little... Um, um, a shop or so, and then again farms and homes placed and all. And so when we start looking at where we're going to place items, then we have to look at this from the perspective of what does it really look like. And this is what's great about aerial photographs today is we can kind of get an idea of a street, for example. So here you see an aerial um, shot and you see clusters of farms placed relatively close together. Now this is going to be real important later because we may end up saying, well, we need a one by four or one by eight, um, basically conventional splitter for these areas. And that. So let's look at another architecture here, or topology. Now we start seeing sporadic to where they're scattered at random in that port. And again, look at some of the driveways or the proximity of the of the locations versus the uh, the, the homes uh, or the roadway itself. And we're assuming that the infrastructure is on the rights of way following the, uh, the the highway. And then then you can get some that are sparse that uh, are farther apart. And if we take a look at the left one from the where the roadway is, it's substantial distance. So this can um, um, be a, an issue of some of the termination techniques for drop cables in particular, and we'll, we'll address each of these items. But 
we also have the, the, the case where we could be talking about all three of these being together. So um, as we progress, uh, you know, you may, and I hope you are thinking about your project or your neighborhoods or your serving areas and say, how would I address this one or this one or this one? And hopefully by the end of the session, we'll have some answers for you here as well. And that, so, you know, when we talk about passive optical networks uh, and that these are um, different uh, categories that the International Telecommunication Unions develop standards on. And so I'm going to be giving you some standards and some of the values and where they come from and that so we're traceable. But historically, you know, these are built into an area that's more uh, dense. And that, and so the first one, the home run, is where we're feeding fibers uh, directly from uh, the, the service provider's hub and the splitters placed inside. And what typically happens here is that this type of uh, architecture is good for about three or 4,000 feet, for about a kilometer from the central office and that, and then it doesn't become cost effective um, for it. So it's not going to be an ideal architecture for, um, for rural applications. On the other side, the centralized splitter cabinet, where we place um, a 1 by 32 splitter most commonly, such as the GPON system has, where we place it into the outside plant, um, and then you can you know, sub, uh, then you can service up to 32 subscribers. Well, maybe in that one photograph where we did have a high density area, that we do want to have 1 by 32 splitters in that location, um, that because the density justifies it. But the one topology that we're going to deal with the most in rural applications is going to be the de decentralized or distributed uh, architecture where we're going to have two or more splitters. And, and that's all that uh, when we're talking about distributors, it says two or more. It doesn't say 15, or it doesn't say three, or and that says as long as you have two or more. And then there's a question, do we fusion splice or connectorize the drop? And again, this comes down to the density, um, number one, because and the, the, small, the shorter length drop cables and that where there's uh, the pre-terminated hardened connectors is a good solution for that. But as we get deeper and with low density, traditional splicing techniques um, are easier to accommodate the, these that we're going to talk about. So we have the lower density. Um, we can use traditional um, splice closures and, or, or pedestals, and there's many variations of pedestals today. We want to look at the option of doing mid-entries into the cables because we can perform those pretty much anywhere, especially on aerial drops. And now this, if it's direct buried, we're going to uh, have to access the cable and we're in a non-retrievable slack scenario. Um, but we are going to look mostly at mid-entries and that wherever there's not an existing closure product or uh, a pedestal, et cetera. Uh, we do know we're going to have longer drop cables from uh, either the distribution or the feeders. Um, so the solution, we're going to look at mid-entries. We're going to look at 1 by 2 tapered splitters, which are different than your 1 by 2 splitters, which are even splits, or 50-50%. And we want to maximize the optical line terminal efficiency. And the other one is we can use standard splice trays uh, that accommodate heat shrink, uh, heat shrink protectors here. So um, let me address some bullets here to give you an idea. So the OLT to each ONT, we're going to have to calculate the, the attenuation through a tap splitter because they're going to be different. A 1090 splitter has different attenuation on each one of those legs. Secondly, is we're only going to the first subscriber on the drop leg of those, therefore the distances are going to be different. So loss budgets have to be calculated for each drop. And that so it's easy to once you set up a spreadsheet, pretty easy to uh, to fill these in, um, so forth. Um, so we have the two legs, the tap, the drop itself, the attenuation through it, and then the pass through attenuation on the the non-drop side. Um, FBT stands for fused biconical taper, and this is a technique to where two fibers are put parallel to each other, coatings removed, and they're literally twisted, pulled, and fusion spliced together. And that, and so we'd end up with a two by two splitter. However, during the twisting and the pulling, 
the the splice manufacturing the, the splitter manufacturing equipment is actually pulling on each of the legs with different tensions until they get the percentage that they want for that uh, splitter to be. In other words, it's being passively uh, or actively monitored with light with a light source on the input leg and power meters on the output side being fed back to the controller, which is controlling. So these, this is an automated process to make these splitters, and that, but the technique is called FBT, for fused by conical taper. And by the way, remember it started as a two by two. It end as a one by two with the, this, the, the one leg, it will be cut off and, that, and actually fractured so it doesn't uh, create any uh, Fresnel reflections off the end, and they're monitoring the reflection of the, the, the cut leg as well during this process. Um, so a few examples here are showing a 595 splitter, for example. So we'd lose 14.6 uh, uh, dB on the drop side, but only 0.4 on the throughput side. But as you see, as your um, your taps uh, change, so does the lost budget port. So we're going to show an animation of how this works, and then we'll pick up on the next slide here. Okay, I think everybody uh, get, got to see the concept of the tapered splitter and what we're doing. So basically, we did a real simple animation with only three uh, three items or three homes or subscribers here. And in this case, doing real easy 5% taps on that port, which are basically off-the-shelf splitters. Um, so what we're we're going to do, though, is we're going to incorporate these and that, and we're going to tap off as we go down this rural road. And that, but the other thing too, and on the the second bullet, it says reuse distribution fibers by deploying splitters to activate dead fibers. So to to justify that term, if you imagine that you have the number one fiber, the blue fiber, blue buffer tube going down, we put a splitter there. Well, all of a sudden, only one of those, um, the next fibers, um, we would split off, but that blue fibers basically abandon at that point in the cable and that and so forth as we go down and play splitters, you're, you're abandoning those fibers. So what we want to do later is be able to use those fibers upstream and that to, to maximize the efficiency of the design itself. And, that. and we're going to have a lot of options here. So um, because of the type of um, densities that you're going to have in the locations, we're going to use traditional uh, splitters, 1x32s, 1x4s, 1x8s, 1x2s even. But we're really going to um, take a look at when to use the tapered uh, splitters instead. And, that. and of course, this is going to depend on your, your design. So... Um, and here, and in this slide, we're just showing some combinations of um, some different uh, splice counts or splitter ratios, one to 32. And if you had a 24 fiber, that would bring us up to uh, literally 600 plus um, subscribers uh, on a 12, 24 fiber cable with a one by 32 splitter. But as we go down this uh, more rural areas, our cable, our fiber counts are going to drop. We're still staying with conventional splits here. And that for um, for the one by fours and the one by eights, and however you reverse those, or, or either way, one by four to one by eights, or one by eights to one by fours. Once we get to one by n, though, we have a lot of options in that whether we want to run a 199 splitter or a 595 or a 3070 or so forth. And this is uh, where you you need to get creative on uh, on your design. And that so we want to think differently on this. We want to look at the, the, the splitter area to be served and what's the dense, uh, the counts that we need. But the other one, too, is, um, you know, you really need to take a look at saying, okay, do I need uh, spare fibers here or spare splitter ports? Is there, what's the potential for new 
farms going in or new buildings. It's just like we would do in, in, a, in a citywide environment where you're still looking at zoning issues, you're looking at potential growth and, uh, and making sure that you have enough fibers uh, for future access uh, for these as well. Um, and then, um, you know, we're going to uh, use the reuse fibers as much as we can. We're going to plan for future growth and uh, we're definitely going to be sp uh, spreading this out. So here's um, an idea here. So I, I, mean, I got a few of these charts that I'm going to show. So in this case, I'm running a typical one by two splitter. And the well, theoretically, a one by two splitter is 3 dB. We have to really be using the the um, the G dot the ITU G dot 671 standard values, which gives us minimum and maximum and and the average in the splitter loss. So in the the and the I uh, the G dot 671 standard is the the standard that's specified with B pon G pon 10 G pon X G pon W D M pon. All of them refer to G dot 671 to say this is where you get values for splices, connectors, wave link division multiplexer splitters etc so I'm using the values from the G.671 standard and I'm using the typical or the the middle the average of what you should be accepting so um, so a typical one by two splitter is going to be 3.4 dB loss whether it's leg one or leg two now, now next down we could show a, a 90 10 splitter and that in this case the drop side would be 11.3 dB of loss, but the throughput side is only accounts for 0.6 dB, and that um, then maybe we want to use a 95 or um, 5 splitter with a 15.2 dB drop and a half dB for the throughput um, side, and then we can go to a 99 to 1 splitter. Um, now, in the introduction, we talked about that these products are not new. Now, when and years ago, decades ago, I actually, when I worked for Tektronix as their fiber optic specialist, one of the things we had to do on the, with the first field OTDRs was we literally needed to monitor a lot of the optics and that, including the laser and, and so forth. And that, and so it was very easy for to put in a 199 splitter, and this way we could have the output still going out, but we're monitoring this. These devices have been around literally from the beginning of fiber optics because this is how we monitored power on an inline system with the least amount of input uh, impact to the the fiber measurement itself. <clears throat> and even today, when you're when you're looking at uh, different types of test equipment, pond power meters, for example, with a tap splitter inside, well, guess what they are? They're they're tapered splitters, and that and they, they they work. So this is a very mature product. So this is it's not something new. It's just that most of the time we're using it at the component and the subassembly level, not at this uh, the systems or the outside plant level. So this is just a case of saying these products exist. This is how you can use them for your design. That. So, uh, you know, here's a case, though, it's a, a business issue. If we take that blue fiber and we tapped off a percentage of power levels for the first four subscribers, then we have, we're still continuing down the road. Remember that if we add in a new subscriber into the future, we're going to have to cut into that fiber, which means we're going to drop the subscribers further down until we can do a quick splice to, uh, to account for that in line. So this is why it's very important to try to engineer these up front and to say, well, do we want some slack put in here? Do we want a slack loop? Maybe not necessarily a closure, but if there is a closure, we're going to look at it for um, uh, convenient access for a future uh, um, uh, ad or a to future subscriber. But do remember that you will be bypassing um, and cutting off people downstream if you splice in after the system uh, is installed. Okay. So some considerations that we have to, to uh, look at on the taper design consideration. So besides the splitter, both the drop and the through, is we have we have a splice. So you have the FBT and you have one pigtail coming out of one end and you got two coming out of the other end. You can designate when you buy these if you the, typically they'll come with a one meter pigtail on either end and typically they're either 250 micron or 900 micron. If you want them with a three millimeter cordage with a SC APC connector, you can order them that way. The, the, the people that manufacture, the companies that manufacture these uh, come up with lots of different options for them. But when we splice that FBT into the, the, into the um, 
plant. That means you got a 0.1 dB splice for each of those pigtails. So from the coming through from the um, from your upstream down to the drop cable, that means you've got two splices: one one for the drop, one for the inline. The the other inline is calculated for the going downstream. This is only for the drop. Do we calculate the two um, splices? Um, I prefer that we use the Telcordia GR20 uh, standard, which is uh, 0.1 dB per splice. Uh, some of you may have um, tighter splice values. I'm a little concerned sometimes about these because it, it depends on the age of the fiber that you have in the plant that the tolerances may be legacy tolerances and not as good as newer ones. Therefore, you may not be able to achieve a 0.1 dB splice. Um, matter of fact, uh, in the uh, January issue of ISE, there's an article um, specifically on this issue of aging fibers and tolerances. So I hope you take a look at it when the January issue comes out. Um, the the other is the uh, cable attenuation. So in the GPON standard, for example, G.984, uh, the downstream uh, fiber attenuation is uh, 0.3 dB, and whether it's 14.9 or 15.50, they're so close it, does, it doesn't matter um, before. It. But the upstream attenuation is 0.4 dB per kilometer at 13.10 from the subscriber. Um, so you're going to get two values from the splitter as well, the drop side and the pass-through side. Um, we also have to calculate for the drop cables themselves. So um, the, connect, the connector attenuation values, 0.5 dB. This is a G.671 value as well, by the way. That's for a mated connection. The splice attenuation, remember we're having a 0.1 dB splice. So if you put a pigtail at the end of your drop cable, then you're going to add 0.1 dB there and a 0.5 for the, the connection. Or if you do a splice on connection, then um, your loss actually should be lower. Uh, the fiber attenuation, I just gave you a value here based on uh, a 328-foot drop, in, that, in other words, a tenth of a kilometer. Uh, and so we got three hundredths of a dB. So as you can see, the loss is not in the fiber. The loss is in the connector itself in that, and any splice. So, you know, the links are going to vary um, based on it, but you can dress slack out very easily. And you also, with the new splice on connectors, you have the ability, if you're doing a single fiber termination at the end, it's your choice whether you want to do a mechanical version or a fuse on version. version. If it's a uh, Digital communications, the UPC polish is uh, is good enough for it. If you, if you're good doing RF overlay, though, the APC polish, the angled physical contact, is uh, is recommended. Okay, so some other uh, considerations. Uh, we're looking at some different uh, ratios and how to use splitters. Uh, so a 1 by 32 splitter has a mean loss of 15.8 dB. Again, we're not using theoretical values. We're using the G.671 values. And again, um, the 20 kilometers uh, times uh, 0.3 dB per kilometer, 6 dB, the upstream would be 8 dB of loss. The connection splice, the, split, the splice losses are still there. Um, one thing, because we're going to base this on the loss budget between the OLT and the ONT, and you could decrease the split ratio to a 1 by 16, depending on the density and the use. Uh, most of the calculations I've done, you can fall into about 25, 20, 23 to 25 users, um, and that on per OLT. So we're not getting the maximum 32, but uh, we're, we're being as efficient as we can with the, the values based on loss budget, which I'm going to talk about and give some examples. Um, some cases, so uh, when your port ca cost, uh, count goes uh, down, so your OLT cost uh, per subscriber goes up. So it is a, is a factor. And if we look at the drop cable, you know, one kilometer of fiber um, versus one connector, a connection is 0.5 dB, one kilometer or six tenths of a mile is 0.4 dB. They're roughly the same to give you an idea of how valuable connection losses can be because one of the things that we're going to work on is how to tighten the loss budget up so that you can maximize your OLT efficiency. And so in this case, we'd rather fusion splice uh, drop cables then connectorize uh, for access to it. So hopefully this is big enough screen so everybody can see this, but you know we're showing an idea that from the left to the right that we're going to change our split ratio. So say that we have our first farm and that, so we're going to do a 1 by 99 split. And then, so we have our amount of uh, loss in the fiber coming in, then we have the, the drop fiber attenuation, 
and then we go through the, the splitters and we go to our second um, potential farm. And in this case, I'm just showing a 299. I may be able to use a 199 splitter again. It depends again. You got to do your loss budgets. But in this case, I wanted to show seven examples on one one screen, so I limited myself here. Um, so the third one I did a 397. The fourth one I did a 595 splitter. But notice the sixth one. I did a one by four. A splitter. So I was tapering, 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 and then all of a sudden I had four farms or four residences close to get, closer together. So in this case, I put in a traditional one by four uh, splitter instead, and that which uh, you know allows me as, uh, while I'm eating up a lot of optical power, I hit four subscribers in the same area. It was going back to the the where we got the sparse and the clustered and all this. So I'm looking at saying. What splitters do I need to locate where in this plan and then figure out how to make it work based on my fiber counts and my loss budgets? And then after the one by four, I increase my split percentage to a 1090 splitter, for example. And then at the, the far end, when I get down to the end of my loss budget, then I can do a, the, my choices are one by twos, one by fours, one by eights. But you pretty much go into even splits at that point. You could do tapers, but uh, it just makes sense at the end just to, to uh, do a one by two and say, well, okay, we're at the end of our reach here. Um, so again, we're going to be lo located uh, with uh, based on our loss budget in particular, but but it's going to be defined by the density and the locations of the subscribers. And, uh, fortunately, the the splitter manufacturers do a great job of packaging splitters. Most of them have dealt with how to package splitters based on the fiber distribution hub or the the pedestal, the fiber access terminal, and the two to the left side are more on that. What I want to focus on is the tapered splitters in the splice tray itself, and that so they're very easy to to work with in this application. Um, for it. So here's here's a few examples of that. So where would they be located? Well, number one, as I mentioned, you have the FBT is going to take one slot. You have three pigtails. That means four slots out of that tray are going to be dedicated to to a, um, a one by two splitter. And that. So if you increase your count, then you're, of course you have to know if it's a one by four. That means you've got the one, the four plus the splitter. So it's going to take six slots, etc. But the the fact is, we're using standard splice trays here. There's no magic to this. You know, as long as the, the FBT splitters and their housings fit into um, uh, heat shrink protector slots, so it makes it very convenient for you. You will have some color code and some mismatches, but that's going to be typical in any pond because, you know, other than your blue to blue on your first drop, everything else is your fibers are going to be um, um, changing as you progress because you're you know your your next fiber, for example, for on another one could be an orange fiber in, and then a blue drop, for example. Um, but uh, some color code management and that uh, is going to have to take place. Okay, so let's look at some of the questions regarding the loss budget. One thing in the uh, unless you're using what's called extended reach, most pond systems are based on a 20 kilometer or 12 mile span distance, and there's a couple things on this. That distance is defined by two things. One, attenuation, which most people on the outside plant deal with all the time. But it's also matched for dispersion, the total amount of signal spreading, which is actually going to be up to 40 kilometers because you've got downstream and upstream. And uh, So, you know, when someone says, well, i got a 25-kilometer span, in that case, you better talk to the manufacturer of your OLTs and your OLTs because they're going to have to compensate for the dispersion by using a, a narrower line width laser to do so. So it's not just attenuation, it's a dispersion issue. Um, the values, though, on the fiber, uh, 0.3 dB per kilometer at 1490, um, 0.4 dB upstream at 1310. Um, we, we want to use the G.671 values for our loss budget, not the theoretical values. Uh, and that and an example is the one by 32, where we can see there's a 0.8 dB difference in the theoretical versus the, the real um, splitter level that you're going to get. Uh, the 0.5 dB for connections, as stated before, um, G.671 standard value, splice is 0.1 dB, Telcordia GR20. Um, OLTs and ONTs, though, your transmit and receive power levels are based on the, what's called the class type. And that, and so what's happened when the standards are were written, uh, there were different um, levels assigned because 
the industry understood that not everybody's going to be close into the the hub site and that some of them are going to be much further out and so we have to make sure that we have enough optical power um, for the worst case but at the same time why should you buy a more expensive laser or a more sensitive detector if you're going relatively short range which such as the home run architecture so each data rate has specific power optical power levels and these are um, categorized as part of the optical distribution network, which is the basically the ITU term for outside plant, except technically it does include the optical interface on the OLT and the ONT, in other words, the lasers and the photodiodes. But these classes are defined as A, A, um, A, B, B plus, C, C plus, C plus plus. And, that, and as we go to the C plus plus, this is the highest power level that we can buy. Um, from vendor A, B, or C, it doesn't matter. They they provide they manufacture these with all sorts of different uh, optical power levels based on the system that you're going to design. And we're going to take advantage of the the fact that the standards include these, and your your um, suppliers make products for these. We also keep you know just keep in mind that you know when we say a certain wavelength, it's actually the center wavelength. So the you know the enhancement band for downstream digital content, we say 1490, but the spectrum's 1480. To 1500, and for RF overlay for cable TV, um, 1550 to 1560, we just say 1550. Upstream in the original band, also known as the O band, the center wavelength between 1260 and 1360 is 1310 nanometers. So that normally would just say 1310, but the, actually the laser could be anywhere there. So, uh, and then each of these power levels gives us we have minimum and maximum power levels that are in the standard. And that so we can design based on worst case, or we can design um, based on worst case. So in this case, I'm, I'm looking at a C plus optics OLT ONT combination, and between this downstream, I can have a dynamic range running from 33 to 37 dB, and that so I can have a lot of plant loss in if I buy C plus cards, and that for the upstream attenuation is uh, from 31 and a half to 35 dB. And if you look at either side, you can see the optical output level, and that which would be transmission because it's output. Um, and then the sensitivity is a photo detector. So say, in it, for example, on the ONT, the sensitivity, if you come in at less than minus 8 dBm, you will overdrive that photo detector and you'll need to add an attenuator on. But if you go less than minus 30 dBm, then you're going to have noise, uh, basically bit error rates and that because we're down into the noise level um, of the system. Our, by, uh, on, the, on the left side, our transmit level, though, can be up to plus 3 to plus 7 dBm, and our sensitivity, again, for the photo detectors there. So every one of these OLT, ONT combinations is determined by a class, and that class defines the, the amount of optical power that we have. And when we want to use these, we just want to also make sure we have a few extra dBs set aside for uh, safety margins for aging, uh, thermal changes, uh, restoration, um, for, for so. Okay, so here I wanted to show a couple things in the G.671 standard. So one of them was showing the, in the a typical even split on the left side. So the um, it doesn't say theoretical loss. This is saying the maximum loss, the minimum loss, and the average loss. And it's the average loss that I use in my calculations. And that what this is telling the manufacturers that says when you manufacture these, to, they should be in this these ranges for any of these devices. So, um, so I always look at to say whether they're compliant with G.671. The other thing too is G.671 calls out a couple terms. One's a wavelength independent coupler and uh, known as uh, so as a wick coupler and what this means is the attenuation um, through especially through even splits has to be the same attenuation regardless of wavelength or direction but a wick and a tapered splitter would be the the same attenuation whether it's 1310 or 1490 and that but e but either direction would change based on the split percentage but it is a, uh, a wick category um, splitter. So here I want to just show 
you know, let's do this in a bar graph format. So um, let's say our launch power from our OLT transmitter was plus 5 dBm. We have X amount of connections in the plant, in this case, four, four different panels or connections that have to be each, 10 splices at 0.1 dB. Our fiber loss at 20 kilometers, 12 miles, was uh, only 6 dB. So up to the splitter, if we did this as a point-to-point, -point, P2P, and that up to the splitter, um, you know, we could see the hash line going across that we would be at about minus 4 dBm in that. But notice our photo detector power on the right side. That photo detector has a range from about minus 8 to about minus 28 dBm, which means right now if I didn't have the splitter and I would overdrive that photo detector on it. So I need to add attenuation. Fortunately, optical splitters attenuate. So if we see after a 1 by 32 splitter, we should be coming in about minus 22 dBm. And if it was a 1 by 64 GPON, it would be about minus 25 dBm. So that's, that's a pretty, pretty easy um, one. And you can see where the, the attenuation is. And by the way, this is calculated on the 13, 10 nanometer upstream value. Um, and that, you have to do them both upstream and downstream. So let's look at, uh, at this one here. And in this case, we're doing a tapered splitter. So we still have the same amount of uh, the output power. We've decreased two connections because we're not doing a hardened uh, termination drop. Still, um, we have to calculate how many splices we're going to have. And again, we're closer in at this point. You know, um, fiber loss is lower. But our splitter, our drop side, uh, or throughput side, you have to calculate it as one. In this case, 0.6 dBm, or 6 dB. So if we notice here, our receive power from the hash line going over is about minus 1 dBm. We're going to overdrive that photo detector at that first subscriber. And that, so, um, so depending on the way we use the splitters, we have to calculate this because we may have to add in attenuators for some of the subscriber locations. Okay. So here's a... Uh, a, a different with a 1 by 32, again, showing the uh, the values again and watching. The main thing you want to do here, you want to you want to justify every one of your losses, where, where these come from. And uh, the other one is to pay attention to the ONTs, photo detector, uh, for, um, if, if, because if you're overdriving that, you will need to add an optical attenuator in. And... Um, I'll talk about those in a little bit still. So here's a, a through spl uh, splitter one two. Um, actually, this is it says through. This is actually a drop, but uh, so we have 11.3 dB on the 1090. The 10% 10 drop side would be 11.3. In this case, to the subscriber with a 1090, we um, we would be uh, coming in at about minus 12 dB, and we'd be in the lighter blue. Uh, and that, and, but we'd be within the detector's operating range very easily here, and we wouldn't require an attenuator. But this is why we want to calculate for every one of these drops is to make sure that we don't have a, uh, an issue with the attenuation power. So a couple things here. Um, one, I want to talk about the attenuator. I'm going to get to these points. Um, there are there. Uh, there's a, a special att attenuator that's out in the industry. I probably should have put a slide on it, but it's uh, it's a non-intrusive variable attenuator to where each 90 degree turn in this device adds one dB of attenuation um, on the downstream side at 1490. And because um, single mode fiber is bend sensitive, this splitter does not affect the 1310 nanometer wavelength, but it attenuates the 1490 or 1550 nanometer downstream. If you're interested in this, um, send me an email, Larry at lightbrigade.com, and I'll, I can send you information on who the vendor is and so forth. Uh, I try to be vendor neutral in that, but there are a couple that have helped out in some of the, the, the values that I've got. So to summarize, low density affects the type of splitter to be used. We don't necessarily have to do conventional equal split splitters in that. These are known products in the industry. Um, to maximize the take rate on an OLT and that the amount of subscribers you can have, that the use of tapered splitters provides the best and most cost-effective option for these. Um, and the, the number of subscribers that you can have on an OLT is based more on the class that you buy your OLTs and ONTs so that you can maximize the optical output level 
um, both upstream and downstream, as sure as well as the detectors' sensitivity levels too. Um, each subscriber, you have to do a loss budget bi-directionally on each subscriber um, uh, drop, and again, a spreadsheet makes this a lot easier to do. Uh, and because the attenuation is going to vary with the tap percentage, and at the same time, the distances to each subscriber is going to change, and, and therefore the amount of splices, possibly connections as well will. Um, tapered splitters do not require special splice trays. They'll fit in your standard splice trays. And I put some thanks here to a couple companies that, uh, that make tapered splitters. Uh, Lytel, uh, one in particular, uh, makes actually the machinery that makes um, fused by conical tapers as well. So if you want to get into the FBT business, they, you can talk to them as well. And Senko Advanced Products, uh, which is very helpful in, um, in providing uh, calculations and so forth for it. So um, I want to um, definitely thank those, uh, those companies for their, their support on this. And so now I'd like to uh, address some questions. And that's so... Uh, I believe Janice we'll is going to open that up. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. Uh, really great detailed information. Um, I so value your webinars because you have fantastic charts and um, statistics and uh, even the video, uh, even though it was, like you said, rudimentary, it's just good to see. The visuals are so powerful, so I really appreciate the effort you put into it. I know it takes a lot of time. Um, please now, if you would, we're going to open up the um, webinar to Q&A. So please enter your questions. Um, no question is, you know, an incorrect question. We can answer all simple and complex. But I'm going to start out with um, this one here that came in during the presentation. It says, in the example of tapered design, uh, they thought it might have been slide 19. I don't know if you want to go back to that one or not, but um, does the 1-4 splitter provide three services lines and the 4 continues to the end? That's what he's wondering. Uh, yeah, yeah, and it, well, you, you, you should do it that way, if you're gonna, especially if, you're, if you don't want the 1 by 4 to be at the end. I think if you go to slide 18, um, and that it, it shows a little better and that, but it's a small graph, but the one by four is in the middle. However, the blue line does show as if it wasn't one of the drops, and that, that's just a graphical error on, on my side here. So normally I would use one of the four drops, but I would take with a one by four splitter, which would be about uh, 6.6 .6 dB of loss. So um, whether it's a drop side there or whether it's a through side, it would still be 6.6, .6, and I'd still just add that into my calculations, but yes. You know, three service, one drop, or three drops, one service. Okay, Go okay. excellent. Thank you very much. Um, also, someone would like to know what percentages are tap couplers available in? Oh, that's good. Yeah, um, well, you can very easily get them in, uh, in 5% increments, but they are available as low as 1%, and the two vendors I listed both had 1% increments available. And, you know, as, as I mentioned, we've used these um, tap splitters for ages for, for monitoring live systems. And so if I step away from the FTTX um, specific application here, uh, you could use, for example, if you wanted a 10, a 10 dB um, attenuator, you could put in a 1090 splitter and still have you, where you dropped your attenuation value, but you still have an access port for a fiber. So, you know, think of when you look at uh, splitters, you, you should also be looking at loss budgets going, well, boy, I need to pad this, uh, you know, um, 15 dB at my receiver, but guess what? By only padding 15%, I still have access to the other end of the fiber. I could test power levels without having to unplug from my network. In that. And you could do whatever percentages you want by using these. So think of them also that if you ever have a need for an attenuator and you want an inline monitoring tap, great application for ta tapered splitters, and that's what they were originally designed for. That's great. I love that. Uh, you can check it without you know, disrupting your network. That's fantastic. Good point. Um, another question here asking, are these wavelengths independent? Um, oh, okay, so the wavelength independent couplers and that are, th this is uh, 
when the ITU developed the, the G.671 fiber optic passive devices or component standard, it had to address different variations. And in this case, um, it was driven toward uh, the G.983, the original BPON, Broadband Passive Optical Network Standard, and then subsequently it's, it's um, been grandfathered into all the newer ones, but the values are there. And what they asked for was that the um, regardless of wavelength or regardless of direction, it would show the same attenuation. However, and, and the difference here was in a 1 by 2, 1 by 4, 1 by 8, 1 by 32, whatever, um, it would be absolutely true. When you go to the tapered one, the wavelength, it's independent on wavelength, which is true, but the direction changes because the drop side and the tap side are different. But it is in the standard, the, the G.671 standard on the tapered, so it's one of those where there's two variations of the same product. One's a 100% WIC and the other one's a 50% WIC splitter. Got it. Okay. Uh, another question here is asking, can I read them through or read them through um, with an OTDR. Okay, so um, what happened with the OTDR is, is it's actually easier to measure through a tapered splitter than it is through an equal split because if you if you test through an equal split after say a one by four splitter if you if you if you drop six point six dB down then you've got four drops or so. They're all going to be approximately the same length, but the, the attenuation through the splitter is the same. And so what that, uh, what that allowed you to do, with, what it does on the OTDR screen is they'll overlay each other, and the only difference you'll see on them is that you'll get different Fresnel reflections or reflective um, events from the glass-air boundary at the far end connection where it a spike in that. So you may get four different spikes there, and you don't know which one's which. But that a tapered splitter, on the other case, if it's a 1090, you're going to see two line. You're going to see your drop, and then 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 the um, the throughput line is going to be the upper drop because that's the the least amount of attenuation. So you're going to see your splitter, then you're going to see a, a, an upper trace, and that's going to be your throughput line. Then you're going to see a lower trace, that's going to be your drop line. But you'll be able to measure with your OTDR the different uh, the losses, um, whether it's through or whether it's a drop. And the neat thing here is because these drops are going to be much longer, you know, um, uh, links that a lot of times your OTDR has problems with very short distances after a long span. So if you're going the full 20 kilometers and all of a sudden you're hitting a cul-de-sac with the 75-foot drop cables, you know, you're, you're fighting pulse width and that uh, on your uh, OTDR. So you're going to love uh, the tapered signatures on an OTDR versus an equal split one. So thank you. Good question. Great. You know, Larry, I actually have a question. Um, not sure if this is even... Uh, you know, monitored, uh, but do you have any indication of the percentage of tapered splitters used out in the industry? I mean, is well, it, is it uh, dominant I don't, or is it small? Yeah, um, they're used mostly in manufactured products, which we're not seeing under the hood, shall I say. So, um, but we're constantly, virtually every laser that's used is being monitored from the, the rear facet of the laser. We're, everybody thinks that a laser is only uh, emitting out of one side. It's actually emitting out of the back side as well, which is monitored by a photo detector. But, but a lot of times we need to monitor power levels. So the more complex the systems get, the more use of tapered splitters. Test equipment in particular uses tapered splitters. Um, so, but it, it hasn't really been used in the outside plant because we've been so used to doing point-to-point -point networks and so forth. And, uh, you know, you're trying to design a system that's cost-effective. And so this is a solution that, that says you can use these this way and get the most amount of utilization from your OLT uh, by using this technology. So it is a mature product. It is in the standards. It's just a, it's a more um, rare um, use of them. Now, so we'd like to see more of them. And again, I'm I'm in the education and training role, so I monitor the net the, the industry from components up through systems. And we see these um, products, and then we say, hey, you know what? This would be a good solution for somebody in a rural application here, and they should know about this. So it was uh, fun to put this presentation on together because we could present something different, you know. Right. I, I love it because uh, it is such a very big issue right now for a lot of uh, service providers, you know, reaching out to the rural areas. And then, 
you know, looking at that and elements too with uh, the future of 5G. So good to good to have that. Um, one more question is, uh, what length pigtails do they come with, and what are the connector and diameter options? Okay. Um, remember that the, these are uh, the component manufacturer, and they're, they want to cr um, sell as many products as they can with whatever somebody wants. So in, in some ca most cases, I would say that they're coming with a 250 micron, one meter pigtail on each end of the, sp of the splitter. So, um, and some of them color code those, some of them don't. Uh, of course, you never know where they're going to go into your network, but they're always uh, labeled one, two, or three. So even if they're not color coded, they'll be labeled for you on uh, which, uh, which port is which. And that, um, but you can get them to where you can get up to three millimeters, which is almost bigger than the heat shrink protector fitting that's going over it, but they have to put on a larger size housing. So if you want it to be like a, a, a jumper with an inline splitter, the packaging to protect it and strain relief, the, um, the um, um, Kevlar uh, has to be performed. So it's going to be a little bulkier there. So um, I would suggest trying to stay with the 250 micron or 900 micron coating if you're going to be in the outside plant with traditional splice closures. If you're going to use it as a monitoring product uh, or a testing product, then I would order the three millimeter option with um, uh, give, give me a little more redundancy and strength, you know, on the components themselves. Okay. Um, one mm -hmm. other um, item too, and I probably should have put this on a slide. We have a, um, a DVD called uh, Fiber Optic Passive Devices, and uh, this uh, DVD we're going to be putting it online pretty soon. But right now it's only under a DVD format. But it explains and it shows how FBTs are made and, and planar splitters and that. So it addresses uh, virtually everything in the G.671 standard, but with a lot of animations and explaining how it works. So if this would be beneficial to you, I know they're under $100 or so, but uh, send me an email, Larry at LightBrigade.com, and uh, make sure that I that price holds because I just committed myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That is very helpful, and I'm sure some people will take advantage of it. All right. Well, um, I don't think we have any more questions right now. I'm sure there's a lot out there, but um, uh, perhaps I'll reach out to you individually. And uh, thanks again, Larry, so much for this topic because it, there's a lot to it, uh, a lot of different elements, and you really provided good insight and detail, so we appreciate that. Everybody attending, we're going to be respectful of your time. We're ending a smidge early today. Thank you so much for joining, uh, taking time out of your day to educate yourself and stay in tune and on top of the industry and the new technologies available. Please do keep on uh, in touch with us and go to www.isemag.com to keep up on new webinars that are coming down the pike. And uh, the content, like Larry mentioned, we've got our January issue coming out. He's going to have an article in there. And uh, you can also access our magazine online, as well as exclusive web articles that are very valuable. So we hope uh, you will take advantage of that content and education. Please remember, uh, today is a great day. Smile. It will make you happier. Everybody, thanks so much. Have an amazing rest of your week. Bye-bye. Larry?